Well, Jamie Shea is a former NATO Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges, and I'm pleased to say he joins us now on the program. Great to have you back on the show with us. So there have been declarations of unity from the United States and Europe over possible Russian action in Ukraine, but in reality, different countries have very different ideas about how far they would commit to any action against Russia, don't they? Well, I think uh, that NATO has done a good job of staying united uh, on the crisis. I've been at NATO in the past on many occasions when the alliance was far less united than it uh, is uh, today. Uh, united in the strong warning uh, to Russia not to invade Ukraine, uh, united in being ready to impose uh, stiffer uh, economic penalties on Russia if nonetheless it goes ahead and does uh, invade Ukraine for the third time, it has to be said, since uh, uh, 2014, united in being prepared to reinforce uh, uh, the NATO member states in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, who obviously are very nervous about a possible spillover uh, of a conflict in Ukraine uh, onto NATO territory, and finally, uh, united in being willing and ready to negotiate with Russia, like uh, we NATO held a, a meeting with Russia in Brussels last week, to give Russia what we call an off-ramp, uh, a chance to climb down, a chance to de-escalate, particularly by talking about arms control and military stability in Europe, if the Russians are prepared to, to take it. So yes, of course, you're going to have some nuances over this or, or, or that, but I think in the main, it's it's clear that on those, in those four critical areas, NATO is standing together. You say nuances. Uh, I wanted to ask you about Germany in particular. It has a new leader, um, perhaps unwilling to send troops. How much of a factor is Russia's gas supplies in all this? Well, yes. I mean, clearly, uh, the Russians were, are very much hoping that they can use uh, gas uh, as a lever, uh, particularly uh, against Germany, because uh, the European Union does import 40 percent of its gas uh, from uh, Russia. Uh, but that said, number one, the EU, EU is trying to lessen that dependency by uh, going to uh, other players, particularly Norway at the moment, uh, Algeria, Nigeria, uh, the United States for liquefied natural gas to be able to diversify, diversify uh, its supplies, which will therefore uh, make that Russian sort of instrument uh, less potent. Secondly, I think the Germans uh, uh, have uh, stood up in the sense that they are willing to freeze uh, the operation of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline recently completed uh, if Russia in invades Ukraine. And that would make Russia pay a particularly a high penalty. I mean, Europe may need to buy Russian gas, but Russia needs to sell that gas. So that sort of pressure uh, works uh, 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 both ways. The final thing is, fortunately, the winter so far in Europe uh, remains comparatively mild, so far at least, which means that the volumes of gas in storage uh, will be adequate to cover uh, Europe's needs. So uh, my own sense is that although Russia may sort of uh, brandish the gas weapon, uh, it's not something in this crisis which is really going to uh, exercise a decisive role. And further talk today of uh, more severe economic sanctions, heavier than anything seen before. That's how the British Prime Minister described them. What do you think those will look like? We heard that perhaps there would be restrictions on exports from our correspondent. Uh, what do you think restrictive sanctions might involve? Well, uh, this is a complicated business because they have to cover various areas. We've spoken about Nord Stream 2, where the German government is showing solidarity on that front, at least, uh, with the uh, Allies. Uh, there's also been talk, for example, about excluding uh, Russia from a SWIFT a banking clearance system, which would make it impossible for Russia to receive payments for its trade or for its energy and so on. That, that would probably hurt quite a lot. There's talk about freezing Russian sovereign debt uh, out of uh, international uh, markets. Uh, there's also talk about uh, targeting certain technologies, particularly consumer electronics, those kind of things, uh, which obviously would hurt uh, Russian consumers. But these sanctions are always complicated because, of course, Russia has anticipated in advance that it could face those sanctions in the future. 
future. So, for example, in terms of banking clearance, it's been trying to see if it can come up with alternative arrangements. And clearly, as always with sanctions, uh, the West or anybody imposing sanctions want to look at things that really do uh, punish uh, an aggressor while doing minimum damage to one's own economy. And, of course, those kind of trade-offs are not always easy. And I think that's the reason why there's been a lot of work in recent weeks um, uh, between the United States and the European Union to try to come up with a package that meets those criteria, really inflicting pain on Russia as a deterrent to aggression, while at the same time uh, being the sort of things that are going to do least harm uh, to uh, NATO's own economies. And that's a fine balance that somehow has to be struck if those sanctions are going to be effective, because they've got to hurt, but they've got to be the kind of things that at the end of the day, the US and the EU will really implement. Jamie Shea, great to get your thoughts today. Thanks very much for talking to us. Thank you as always.